Are constantly climbing subway fares and bridge and tunnel tolls making you see red? Are you just plain disgusted at the behavior of corporate executives and directors, all of whom seem to want to walk away from scandals at their companies with nary more than a slap on the wrist? Or maybe you're worried about global warming. If any of these thorny issues is bothering you, you'll enjoy our guest today, New York State Controller Alan Hevesy. I'm Sarah Bartlett, your host on USA, Inc. Joining me today is Alan Hevesy, New York State's controller, who was elected to keep an eye on the state's financial affairs and to make sure that the retirement funds of nearly one million state employees are being soundly invested. Alan, thank you for being here today. My pleasure, Sarah. Why don't we talk about uh, the thing that's probably gotten you most press recently, which is the WorldCom activity, and explain why would the New York State controller have anything to do with WorldCom? Well, we are uh, sec the second largest pension fund in America after California. I'm sole trustee, one of my jobs as controller. Um, and as a result of the corruption scandals of the 90s into 2001, which were um, more damaging than I think the public understands, um, Enron, Global Crossing, Tyco, uh, uh, Sendant, uh, Bayer, uh, McKesson, uh, WorldCom, uh, and dozens of others not only affected the universe of people who worked for the companies and lost their jobs, who were retirees and lost their pensions, who worked for supplier companies and they went out of business, but also the economy in general. The, um, in, in, in 2002, um, the, I asked my staff when the WorldCom revelations came through that WorldCom had committed the gr granddaddy of all frauds. They've admitted a, a $11 billion in fraudulent filings to artificially keep the value of their shares high. Uh, was there some econometric model that could judge the impact of these scandals on the economy? And as we started to look, we found out the Brookings Institution had done that, and they had assessed that in the five months of the um, WorldCom revelations when there's no other variable to affect the economy, uh, the American um, economy lost $35 billion in economic activity. Extrapolate for New York, that was $3 billion in economic activity, a billion dollars in lost tax revenues in five months, and the pension fund, uh, I was not then state controller, but the pension fund then lost $15 billion in asset value, of which $9 billion, according to this modeling, was ascribable to the scandals. Um, under federal securities law, the largest investors uh, become lead plaintiffs in the securities litigation when there's fraud. So we're very active. And I'm the lead plaintiff by name, individually, and our fund uh, on behalf of the class of thousands of investors in the WorldCom case. So that's how we got involved. And we have five or six other cases that we're involved in as well. Now, you did something very unusual. You, um, according to the press, insisted that whatever settlement was reached with the directors of WorldCom, that they should have to pay personally towards the settlement. What made you decide to do that? Well, the environment is, of course, there is no WorldCom. So how do you make recompense for people who have lost their, their fortune, shareholder value, their retirements, and so on? I mean, this is, this is sort of an angry response. And in the lawsuits, historically, when you got to the role of the director, the director is supposed to be the whistleblower. The director is supposed to say to the manager who is doing, committing these corrupt acts or the team of managers, you can't do this. And very often the directors are just, you know, they're enjoying the good life and not doing their jobs. And that the, the overwhelming majority do. I want to be fair about this. But in the, in the case of WorldCom, they, they, the filings were, uh, were misleading on their face. That's not me saying it. That's the judge in the case uh, making such a ruling. Uh, so while they were not culpable of a fraud, uh, we felt that they had a responsibility. And therefore, to do what was traditional is not a deterrent, which is, okay, there's some settlement, their insurance company will pay it. They didn't even pay the premiums. I thought it was unfair. So I insisted as the lead plaintiff, uh, maybe we're breaking some new ground, but um, that they, they're, they're going to have to pay um, themselves. Um, they won't admit culpability. That's what you do in a settlement, and so I have to be careful how I ascribe their behavior. But the bottom line is that 10 of the directors agreed that, uh, of the 12, that um, a, a, net, a gross 
um, value of their assets, 20% uh, would be uh, recovered in the asset. In other words, you take away, you, you give them a home and their pension, and then 20% of, of, everything, their, of everything else uh, will come in a settlement that totaled $18 million. And we're now in negotiation with the 11th director. Now, how did you come up with 20%? I mean, how do you it's, decide? It, it wasn't a magic number. Zero is unfair. Bank bankrupting them is unfair. Why? Oh, uh, because they, they didn't commit the fraud. I mean, Bernie Ebers, the manager, he's, he's uh, on trial now. It's just starting uh, for X number of counts of fraud. Uh, if he's found guilty, he'll go to jail. Uh, they didn't commit the fraud. Uh, they were, again, I've got to be very careful because of the settlement agreement. They have some responsibility as to uh, the fact that it happened. Um, so uh, I don't want to discourage directors. We want directors. We just want them to do their job and to be responsible and to ask the right questions and get the documents and keep a paper trail. Well, that's one of the questions that's come out of this is um, these people, as you've said, they, they did nothing to commit the fraud. There's no evidence of that. They had a lot of stock in WorldCom, too, and I've, I've read numbers as high as $250 million that they lost of mm -hmm. their own money. So why is it fair for you to come along and say, well, I think they should lose even more? And well, won't that discourage people from becoming directors? I don't think you sincerely believe the import of the way you phrase the question. Uh, I don't think you're sympathetic to the question. Uh, the answer is that um, shareholders got hurt terribly. I represent the shareholders. Um, that's not a, a self-starting assignment. That's federal law. The federal law, by the way, was written by Newt Gingrich and conservative Republicans to protect business from nuisance lawsuits and said, let the responsible large investors be the lead plaintiffs. So we're playing that role. But if, if someone is, and I want to generalize again because of the settlement agreement, but if someone, it's one thing that you committed the fraud, and we're going after you, whatever we, we can get back, we'll get back, and if that bankrupts you, that's too bad. You've destroyed a lot of lives. And if you committed crimes, you know, hope, hopefully the SEC or Elliot Spitzer is going to get you. Um, now, because there's no world coming, went bankrupt, we're suing those who were participants, who should have warned. We settled with Citigroup biggest bank in the world for $2.6 billion in this case. This is the second state settlement. But here are these directors who, um, whose job it was is to prevent things from happening. And they failed to do so. So they've got to, I, in my opinion, they have to have some responsibility. Uh, there are 16 other underwriter banks that we're pursuing. And we're ready to go to trial on the 28th of February. This is the first time, though, that directors have really been, been held personally accountable. And I think it's interesting. Why have they escaped this accountability until now? Why didn't the SEC think about this? Why, why is it that it, it took you coming along and saying, you know, enough is enough? Because I'm aberrant and bizarre. <laughs> or because, look, the, the truth is, uh, during the boom of the 90s, when most of these frauds were being perpetrated, we were making huge amounts of money. I was a genius. My, my pension fund doubled in value and asset value, and everybody else's did. We were, it was great. Uh, the truth is that we were asleep as, at the switch as a community. Shareholders didn't assert themselves. And there are a lot of shareholders, including pension fund managers, m the middle size and smaller ones particularly, they don't want to get into the mix of this kind of conflict. Do they want to make you... money, go home, and say they've done their job. Uh, the, the large pension funds are run by people like myself who come out of public policy. Mm -hmm. And we're not afraid of the mix or to fight for changes uh, for Sarbanes-Oxley or for the SEC rules or to set some conditions for accountants who uh, are in collusion with the fraud, which has happened uh, with some regularity. Um, so we're insisting that there be serious regulation. And the reason is we want a level playing field. We want every American to be invested in the markets. We want the markets to grow. We're capitalists. But we're not going to be capitalists in a system when there's fraud that uh, tells us that whatever judgments we make are phony judgments because the information's false and people who are manipulating the system. And we're going to go after you if you do. Do you think that we're going to start to see this kind of concept applied in a number of different cases? Or were there things about WorldCom that I bet there, there's a, a limited number of cases in which uh, the settlement agreements will, will debate, at least the settlers will uh, debate this issue. Uh, on the other hand, WorldCom is pretty unique circumstance. The fraud was so widespread and the culpability so awful and the damage so serious. I mean, Enron is a similar circumstance. We're now finding out the directors are going to pay an Enron. But there it's a different story. One, their insurance ran out. And number two, uh, they made huge profits in the Enron fraud. That didn't happen here. Um, but uh, look, a director does the job. It's not going to be liable. The answer is do your job, take it seriously, 
when you prove in court that you did your due diligence, there's no liability. And by the way, if you do your job, there's no court case. There's no fraud. There's no court case. There's no need to worry about it. So you don't so this is only that, for the no. I, that you've discouraged I, pe good people from going into. I the think there's some there's people be worried, and then the insurance companies will come up with some kind of a second level insurance that is personal only to that. You know, there's there's ways to skin this cat, but the principle is you you know responsibility flows with with your action or failure to act, um, and if some company really has a problem getting a director because of this, call me. We have a whole series of directors that shareholders want to put on boards uh, that are the best, you know, Arthur Levitt, will, if, the, if, the, if it's a right place, Richard Breeden, who's one of the most powerful uh, advocates for corporate um, uh, uh, government, to Haim Saban as a great leader in the communication, they're all available to you. Well, and in fact, let me j just add, yeah. um, Marsh McClellan has had two big hits, the Putnam mm -hmm. problem and then a period of uh, calm, and then uh, Elliot Spitzer revealed their bid rigging. In between, I recommended on behalf of our coalition an independent director. His name was Zachary Carter, former United States Attorney for the Eastern District, and he's been enormously helpful when the second hit came because he, he knew how the company should appropriately respond, and they have responded. And there's no criminal prosecution of them, although they're cleaning up their act. There are a lot of people who are concerned that as more and more public officials who represent public pension funds get involved in these issues, that it's going to politicize what should be really left between shareholders and investors. Um, oh, those people are the shareholder representatives. I mean, I run for office because my job is bigger than running the mm -hmm. pension funds. I'm an elected official, independent. Um, and, and truly nonpartisan. By the way, we're totally nonpartisan. That's our strength. And I'm not naive about this. I was a very partisan legislator. Um, but my job is as a fiduciary. I represent the shareholders. I'm, do, I'm representing those shareholders and, and representing their interests. That's what we do. And so if, if you're the business community that doesn't like these changes, um, you'll, you'll slash back and say, oh, you've got some agenda, as if they don't. Or you're just representing unions, which is nonsense. Um, uh, the, the, or, or you know, we're cutting into their monopolistic authority. We we pursued Disney Company. We were part of the 45 percent shareholder vote to withhold support for Eisner and the board directors. Well, we didn't get the 50 percent, but Eisner has announced his retirement. They separated the the chair. Uh, of the board and the CEO, which is a reform, and they have really good independent directors to the point that three weeks ago, no, two weeks ago, Eisner came in with uh, Fred Langenhammer, who is the new independent director, who seems to be terrific and is completely independent, smart, loyal to the company, just what we need. So we're making changes. It's, you know, we'll have our losses too, but we're making changes and it has nothing to do with the political agenda. And I bet I can answer a question, yes or no, because I think I did that once in 1984. <laughs> so sorry, I'm Well, we're going to stop for a minute. We'll be right back. <laughs> the Zicklin School of Business at Baruch College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time, and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's, and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with New York State Controller Alan Hevesy. We were talking a little bit about the, the politics here, and um, California's public pension fund is, has been in, at the center of some controversy, and they recently lost the, the president of, of that fund. Um, according to the reports, again, about labor issues and being too close to labor. But one of the things that I believe that fund and also yours um, are pursuing is global warming. And I'd just like to know, again, why would a New York State pension fund have anything to do with that issue? Here's why. There's a series of issues, and uh, let me uh, put it in context. When the Texaco company was sued by their own African-American employees for a pattern of approvable discrimination, this goes back a number of years, mm -hmm. Carl McCall and I, state controller, city controller, went to Texaco and said, settle this damn suit, change your policy, because this is going to be an awful mess. You're going to pay out billions of dollars, and it's going to affect the value of our shares. So we were social activists, but it was to correct the problem. When the Cracker Barrel Company of, of Bible Belt Middle America decided to reflect what they thought were middle class values by firing all their gay workers, we went after them because this was wrong on its face, number one, but before the boycotts, the demonstrations, and the lost um, uh, market share uh, and share value. Uh, when Exxon Valdez polluted 
uh, Alaska, um, we, we joined a coalition of environmental, uh, environmentally oriented investors to say, we want our companies to be looking long term to prevent these kinds of catastrophes, not only because of the issue on its face, but because it, it, it affects the value of our shares. If we have companies um, that are in, in the construction business, uh, are in the um, uh, engineering business, are in energy business, and they don't look ahead at the reality of global warming and plan for it, they're being irresponsible. So w why are we into this? We want them to prepare for the possibility that we're hurting ourselves long run for short-term gain. We're long-term investors, and that they ought to be looking at these issues and preparing for the future. Now, very interesting that you, you, you raise this issue. Um, two days ago, Al Gore, who uh, I remember Al Gore. <laughs> I remember. Still funny. He introduces himself. Hi, I'm Al Gore. I used to be the next president of the United States. Um, he is involved with a new private equity fund, which will be environmentally sensitive. It won't be. We hate this uh, company. You know, uh, therefore we're never going to invest in it. We can't do that as fiduciaries. But we want our companies to look forward to prepare sophisticated plans to prepare for the eventuality. It doesn't mean you'll hit, but, but you'll be saving a lot of shareholder value and a lot of jobs uh, and dealing with these social issues. That's why we do this. So you see a tight link between social activism and shareholder returns, which you're, uh, as yeah. you say, charged with, with protecting. Uh, there, it's a very political issue. I was reading a recent Wall Street Journal editorial that referred to you as Lord Hevesy and basically implied that you were really in this more for your own political career and seeking campaign contributions from the lawyers out there who love the fact that you're doing this. Any response to that? Well, but it's nonsense. I'm a shareholder. I'm, I'm, I'm measured, and when I run for re-election, by uh, the value of our assets. And if we can improve our investment return, I can reduce taxes. Now, is that political? I mean, is that what the Wall Street Journal is talking about? Uh, when the Wall Street Journal reveals how many of their advertisers they have uh, skewered in investigations, uh, uh, they'll have some credibility. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with that this is my job. And who made me Lord Hevesy? They, they'd write Lord Hevesy. I got a kick out of that. You know who made me Lord Hevesy? Newt Gingrich. Bob Dole, the right-wing Republicans in the Congress in 1995 when they wrote a law called the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. And when they said that people like me in CalPERS and North Carolina and the big pension funds will take the lead in these cases, that's who did it. So blame it on Newt Gingrich. Okay. Well, I'll try to get him on the show. But in sure. the meantime, <laughs> let's talk about some other part of your job, which is uh, to focus on things like the MTA. You came out with a very critical report in the fall about their financial state and I wonder if you could just explain again to our audience why you th are so concerned about the MTA, what you think the big problems yeah, are. Yeah, and, and again if I talk too long you'll cut I'll me cut off because I'm, yes, I'm, I'm getting really into these issues. In that. We have in New York State a, an other state government. It's not only the dysfunctional legislature and governor and all of that, that's curable and we're on our way to reform, but there's a whole second level called public authorities. There are 746 state and local public benefit corporations, public authority, we call them authorities. I didn't and, realize there were so many. <laughs> and they're out of control because they're unsupervised. Now some of them are very well managed, some of them are mismanaged, some of them are corrupt. The New York Racing Association not only has had indictments for people who stole money, but the agency itself is under indictment by the federal prosecutor. They put in a federal monitor at our recommendation who reports to me. Um, the um, MTA is all three well-managed, poorly managed, and corrupt. What do I mean by that? Well, their capital plan from the 1990s, there were two capital plans, and even the more recent one, for which is though financing, have been terrific. New rolling stock, new security, safety, the infrastructure is dramatically better. On the other hand, last year when we made an issue of their budget, their budget was awful. They, were, they lied. They cooked the books. I have a second set of books. They hid $512 million to time their fare increase at their convenience and didn't tell the public and lied to the public. We fixed that. Katie Lapp, their executive director, has fixed that and we've issued regulations. You're waiting for the corruption yes, piece. Yes, I am. They leased the building at 2 Broadway. It was to be their headquarters. It was a $135 million rehabilitation project. They closed their Midtown office, sell the air rights, and go move in there. Terrific deal. It now costs $435 million, $450 million, but they don't have the money, so they're going to amortize it, borrow it, so it'll be $845 million. Why? Because the $700,000 elevators were built for $6 million. Why? Because nobody was watching. They were ripped off. There were mob guys in there. Four people have been prosecuted and pleaded guilty already. More to come. 
the DAs are in there. If so you're you not accusing the MTA of corruption, you're accusing the people that they hired. I'm, I'm, well, no, there were officials of the MTA there who were involved, well? though. There okay. was some collusion Just there. wanted to clarify that. Um, but it, what I'm talking about is an environment, if you have no supervision, if a government agency can issue debt and no one can say no, if they can do procurements with private vendors and no one's checking, if there are, if they're lobbying activity and there's no reporting, you're going to get a mess. Um, and it's uh, all over the state are these authorities, and some of them, are, we just issued two reports of two Western New York authorities that are well run, but a lot of them are not. The Canal Corporation steered a contract for one developer for $30,000 can develop the entire length of the Erie Canal, hundreds of millions of dollars. No one else knew about it, it was a secret. That, but so let me so stay we have to reform on, that. On the MTA, what do we do about this situation? What is the impact, <coughs> first of all, on, on residents in this region of well, an MTA one, that is out of control? What's bad about the MTA, first, it's an authority, nobody's watching. Uh, they're created to be professional business people, but also make the tough political decisions like raising fares. The problem is that they now go about their business in the following way. They, they produced uh, a few months ago a capital plan, $27 billion. Good. $16 billion for which there is a borrowing but no revenue stream. You know, when you borrow too much money, it's excessive. You borrow to operate, that's wrong. But at least you're paying it. They're not, nobody's paying it. They have to get into a room, the governor, the uh, mayor, the county executives, the uh, unions, all the stakeholders, to bail out, to provide revenue stream, to support this debt and to keep the fares relatively down. Um, that happened with Dick Ravitch in the 1980s. The problem that until, until last week, in effect, the MTA itself wouldn't clean up their own house. They don't need, if they have all this uh, b budget problem, they don't need 644 public relations people or 444 lawyers. They don't need all of that. You, you gotta, it's symbolic. You're not solving your financial problem, but you've got to tighten up. You don't need seven different units, each having their own personnel department, each having their own budget, you know, duplication. So that they have to do, then get everybody in a room uh, in order to develop the revenue st streams to support uh, what needs to be done by way of uh, uh, taxes that are focused on the MTA or uh, support for the borrowing. Now, uh, Peter Calico, who runs the MTA, would say, you know, this is terribly unfair. We've identified 200 million of cuts this year. There's another 120 million next year. You know, we are managing ourselves. We are focusing on that. We do have credibility when we come to you and say we need help. <clears throat> he said that now. Yes, but yes. four months ago, when we said, what's your plan, he didn't. Now they have a plan. They have now put a freeze in. But it's a result of people yet, like me yelling at them mm -hmm. and saying, you can't go to everybody and just say, give us more money, give us more money, and the fare increases will go up forever. By the way, they don't go up. If you raise the fares, you don't get the revenue. There comes some point where people stop riding your, your facilities. Diminishing returns. Uh, diminishing mm -hmm. returns, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so they, they fought us, and the, not necessary, blah, blah, but they, they're doing it. But I don't um, see where we get out of this problem. It seems to me that it's fairly inevitable that there will continue to be fare increases and increases on toll and tolls of bridges and tunnels, and the uh, services that we will be d getting delivered to us for that will go down. And I mean, how will we get out of no, this financial... Anybody who tells you we're not going to have fare cre increases is lying to you. We were told in the gubernatorial election of 2002, no need for a fair increase, baloney. So you have 30 seconds to tell me how we're going to fix the MTA's problem. You need the state and the city to get back into the business of subsidizing this absolutely crucial um, uh, um, service. At a time when in they the 19, have not well, enough money for themselves. <clears throat> that's priorities. In the 1990s, the two five-year capital plans got a billion dollars each from the city and the state each time. <clears throat> in the last five-year capital plan that just ended, zero, nothing. So you need that help, but you need the help with a credible agency that is sufficient itself. I'm sorry we have to call this to a halt. We've been fortunate to have New York State Controller Alan Hevesy as our <clears throat> guest today. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. By insisting that the directors of WorldCom cough up 18 million of their own money to settle shareholder lawsuits, Alan Hevesy has thrust himself into the center of a raging corporate governance debate. 
At issue is the extent to which directors and executives should be held personally liable for bad decisions that occur on their watch. Controller Hevesy should be applauded for taking advantage of the power vested in him as overseer of the second largest pe public pension fund in the nation to right what most people agree was a wrong. But with his initiative comes a new set of risks. The danger exists that other officials will be tempted to use their position at the helm of public pension funds to push their own political agendas in a quest for favorable headlines. It's vital that they remember that their primary duty is to the hard-working state employees whose retirement funds they are charged with overseeing. Political points, no matter how valid, cannot be made at their expense. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.